little plug for next week. We're going to put what we have been learning about being devoted to what? To prayer. Next Thursday, we're going to put it into practice. We're going to have an old-fashioned, old-fashioned healing prayer meeting. So be ready to be healed. Not only emotionally, but also physically. And pray this week that God the Father through Christ Jesus in the Spirit of God will increase our faith in Christ to believe that he will do it again. <laughs> He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And of course we're not going to come to our Father as our paramedic because we have a relationship with him. So just a plug, if you know people who are struggling physically, uh, spiritually, emotionally, that are in pain, bring it next week. I don't know yet how we're going to do it. But I was reading today, Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, that Jesus sent out his disciples to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And then I read the whole chapter and I said, man, there's miracles after miracles in this chapter. Father, do it next week at RTO. Do it even tonight at RTO. Amen. So, little plug for you guys. Don't miss next week. Be here. Let's be here. Let's be praying for each other. Amen. Let's see some miracles happen. All right? Yes. Our Father can do that. Amen. Well, welcome, welcome everyone again. Hallelujah. Here's our title for tonight. Devoted to prayer. Non-negotiable of freedom for Christians number 11. Continuation of part two. As you know, we did not finish part two last week. So we're going to continue this week. This is, here's a biblical text. Rejoicing hope. This is all a commandment. Rejoicing in hope. And as you know, I've been teaching you, uh, as my friend John Piper said, that hope is the soil where a joy grows. Hope is the soil where a joy grows. And as you know, joy is the trademark of a Christian. It is, it is what makes us Christians is that we are joyful. So it says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and then of course, be devoted, be constant in to prayer. Romans 12, 12. So as we heed tonight, as we take this commandment from the Apostle Paul, from the heart of God, the, the Apostle Paul was speaking to us, was writing from the heart of God. Because the Word of God is what? It's inspired. It is infallible, correct? It is all-powerful, all-living. It is satisfying. It is mm, delicious. It is the Word of God. So he was speaking to us from the word of God, from his heart, to be devoted to prayer. So tonight it is my fervent desire to encourage each of you with fresh hope. The food that you ate tonight was fresh, was not out of the freezer, was not from yesterday, it was from today. Hope in, in Christ that is fresh. As I pray fervently and radically for God the Father in Jesus' name for the Holy Spirit to invigorate you, to recharge, to reboot you. I want you to leave here tonight leaping for joy. Especially after you heard the testimony from Ben and the great song from my sister Don and the prayer time that we have, you know, around the table, the powerful prayer by Pastor John tonight, that was powerful, very eloquent, very natural, very real. That's our mission statement here for the RTO. And to motivate you to make RTO part of your weekly schedule. 
and beyond as we aim to make it much more relevant for you and for you to make RTO, yes, sacred. <laughs> And hence, as my friend Ben Evangelista says, a schedule RTO everything. Put it on your schedule. Schedule it in your, in your schedule every week. Not only for you, but also for everyone you know in your circle of influence. If you do that, it will truly be our honor and our joy. Here are just a few radical reasons why we must make RTO part of our weekly schedule, which I trust you find to be true. Number one, RTO is a unique, genuine community that is devoted to prayer for the greater hallowing of God our Father. So number two, at RTO we pray radically as you saw tonight, to love radically. Number three, at RTO we do not pretend. We don't fake it to make it. We don't wear masks, we are real. We keep it real. Number four, at RTO we are committed to living in the healthy tension of truth and grace to exemplify and exalt Jesus Christ who is the fullness of truth and grace. Number five, at RTO the gospel is not compromised. Hence, it is proclaimed and lived out with clarity, with consistency, with credibility and conviction across culture, class, color, crisis, and crime. Number six, at RTO, anyone, and I mean anyone, and everyone is welcomed. That's the gospel. And embrace regardless of what they have done or where they came from. That's a true statement. Number seven, at RTO we come to experience realistic hope. I hate it when people give me false hope. When people give me a promise and they don't keep it. God doesn't do that, therefore we cannot do this at RTO. Christians keep their word. James says, let you yes be yes or you no be no, otherwise you will be condemned. Not by me, but by God himself. It's very important that Christians understand that, that the moment that we open our mouth, we're speaking on behalf of God. Peter says that we have to speak the very oracles of God. We don't say what we think. We don't say what we feel. We say what the word of God says. We are vehicles of God. It's not your life. It's the life of Christ living in you. That's a different perspective that I'm giving you here. And therefore, we have to be careful. When we open our mouth, what we say and how we say it. So at RTO, we come to experience hope that is real, never false hope, anticipating and expecting for God our Father to surprise us. Hallelujah. Number eight, at RTO, we see and experience the power of the Holy Spirit activated. Activated. Number nine, at RTO, we come with the anticipation. I come here with that way. I come here and say, Father, I want to see you today in a more real way. Father, do something that, that will just shake me. That will shake the room. At RTO, we come with the anticipation and expectation of experiencing God our Father's infinite, infinite, and unlimited, how much more? Hallelujah. At RTO, we always have a front seat to redemption. Look at these guys here. Look at Robert. Look at Eric. Look at Graham. I mean, right here, front row. Last week, I argue that the prisons and jails are also a nation. I'm glad that somebody picked on that, Ben. 
So I threw you a new concept that we have never thought about in the church in America. I, as a preacher, I'm always asking the Holy Spirit to give me fresh stuff. I don't want to preach like somebody else. I want to preach like God wants me to preach. So I want to briefly define it for you as I see it. Here are a few reasons. And if you don't agree with me, please let me know. You know my email, you know my phone number, you can call me, you can rebuke me, I, I accept your rebuke. But remember, God has given us a voice for the prisoner. Remember, God has given us a love for the prisoner. And their families. And therefore, we must defend it. So here we are. So I'm arguing that the prisons and the jails are a nation. That's what I'm arguing now. I am arguing that. So here it is, number one, they are a distinct group, distinct group of people with a unique, number two, culture and even a language. And those that have been locked up, you know what I'm talking about. Number three, they are a people group in a culture that has experienced deep pain. That's why next week we're going to have, have a, a meeting of prayer that God's going to take that pain away. Driven by rejection and abandonment by not only a graceless and broken system, but also by the church and the world's, and, and the world's culture. Number four, they are the most neglected and forgotten people group in America, especially by the church because of fear. And that goes against the gospel of love. Number five, they are the people group that have been abused and hence become abusers. In desperate need of God, our Father's grace. Number six, over 80% of this distinct people group come from urban areas. They have been raised in fatherless home. Many have experienced homelessness. 80% of them are also fathers. But they don't know how to be a father. Number seven, 80% of this people group has been invaded by, hence become addicted to drugs and alcohol. Many also suffer from demon possession and demon oppression, which is foreign to many of us, even in this room tonight, as well as mental issues that they face. I also want to argue that the Native Americans, who are also a nation, they refer to them as a nation. And we have recognized them as a nation. Think about it. Have experienced similar experiences as the nation of prisons and jails have experienced. So, so last Thursday, I also argue, I made the strong point that there's an inseparable and essential connection between Jesus' required commandment of the Great Commission to all the nations including the nation of prisons and jails, and Jesus' commandment to make his house, his house, become a house of prayer for all nations, including the nation of prisons and jails. Also last Thursday, after reading, if you remember, and teaching from Ezekiel 36, 22 through 27, I said that our devotion to prayer validates our born-again experience. Being devoted to God the Father, praying to Him, is the crux of the Christian life as we live Christ's resurrected life in us and pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Therefore, being devoted to the Father praying to Him requires a total commitment to being synchronized 100% with the Holy Spirit to empower us not to drift nor deviate from the way, truth, and life 
of Christ Jesus for the sake of cultivating the most glorious, essential, and vital relationship a human being can have, and that is with his or her creator and lover of their soul. Who is he? God, the good, glorious, and awesome Father through Jesus Christ. Hence, as we continue tonight, part two of this message, we must first, number one, get to know the Father as God, sustainer, creator, and Father through and in Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of truth and grace, his only begotten Son and our older brother, we must then, number two, pursue, pursue him aggressively. You know, if you love somebody, you're going to go after that person. You need to pray aggressively. Devoted to praying aggressively. With fervency, sincerity, tenacity, focus, and intensity to discover the unlimited and infinite power of his love. You see, if we would discover this love, it would not be hard for us to love. We can only love because why? Because God the Father loved you first. It was not natural for us to love God. It was unnatural. It goes against our sinful nature, doesn't it? But because he took the initiative. He came to our level through Christ. So he tabernacled. He became a man. He demonstrated the love of the Father, Christ, and the Father are one, you see. So we have to discover the power of his love, and his love is powerful. His love is, has unlimited power. Number three, so we may then become devoted to fulfilling the first and second greatest commandment, Luke 10, 27, to validate the love of the Father in how. That's very important. Love is creative. In how we as his adopted children love without fear and without hypocrisy, just as Jesus loves. Jesus loves is sincere. That's why we follow, we have to be sincere without hypocrisy. As commanded by the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 9, to love everyone and anyone, and here's the key, our Father chooses to send our way because he's sovereign. Hence, it requires a total commitment to the priority of knowing the Father with the same devotion to intimacy with which Jesus knows his Father. In other words, it requires for each of us to be what? All in. To keep it 100. That is why the Apostle Paul the most experienced but yet the chief of sinners and the most radical and committed believer, Christian and missionary with the most radical born again testimony who was all in and who kept it 100 said, take a listen, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in what? My prayers. Romans 1.9. And then he says, rejoice always. Joy is connected to prayer. <laughs> rejoice always. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks for this is what? God's will is that you will pray with us. That's what God says. That you will be devoted to prayer. Of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. We cannot have a pure conscience unless we are devoted to prayer. As my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in what? When? All day long. <laughs> Second Timothy 1.3 That is total devotion to prayer from the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul said to pray without ceasing, he meant it and he lived it. 
he was exhibit A. In other words, Christians have no choice. Now, am I, am I getting to you a little bit on, on your toes here? <laughs> we have no choice but to become a hundred percent devoted to prayer. You know why? Because it's a commandment. How can you rejoice in hope and how can you persevere in affliction if you don't pray? I've been asking God the last few days to give me a cool spirit. Yeah, to, to keep it passionate, to keep it fervent, but to give me a cool spirit. You know, I hate to go to the doctor. I really do. And today I had to go for my annual checkup for my sleep apnea. And I knew they were going to take my blood pressure. <laughs> I just knew it. And I didn't want the doctor to take my blood pressure. So I've been praying all day, Philippians 4. Father, guard my heart. Guard my heart. I don't want to be anxious. I want to be cool, calm, and collected. I want to give a good testimony to my doctor and to his nurse and to the people there when I walk in and, and I have to check in. I want to be a good witness. I want to be joyful. In other words, Christians have no choice but to become 100% devoted to prayer because we have been commanded by Jesus Christ himself as credible witnesses to fulfill what appears to be an impossible mission. Do you see what I'm talking about? We have been given a job that we must do and we're not doing very well. Call the Great Commission in the midst of an explosive antichrist and very hostile environment. Have you noticed that yet? Have you noticed that in America there's a hostility against Christians now? Have you seen that yet? Not only in America, but around the world, in China, and my friend here, Pastor Jiva, in India, and North Korea, and Cuba, and Iran, and Syria, where Christians have lost loss of ground, have suffered loss of casualties and credibility. Take a listen to Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but somewhat doubted. That just hit me hard today as I was getting ready for this message here. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, arise, Joshua. Go, therefore, and make disciples of how many nations? All the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And look at this beautiful thing. Teaching them to observe, to obey all things I have commanded. In other words, we have to know the entire Bible. Because the Bible is filled with commandments. In other words, you cannot give your own gospel. You better not. There's no power in it. You better give the gospel that is in the word. You cannot cut and paste. You have to give the whole thing, including hell. <laughs> including you're a sinner. And you need Christ right now. If you die without, you're going to hell. <laughs> I, I mean, you need to give the whole thing. We cannot just give a little Mickey Mouse gospel. All things that I have commanded you and law. In other words, pay attention, call attention. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Please notice that some of his disciples doubted Jesus' resurrection. Do you? 
So Jesus' resurrection is our permanent receipt. Hence, our devotion to prayer will take away our doubts and insecurities to infuse us with the unshakable confidence of Jesus Christ to become committed to being all in in participating in seeing God the Father hallow his holy name as his great commission is fulfilled not our way but his way to experience his glory and that is by his children Christians becoming 100% devoted devoted to radical prayer as commanded by Jesus himself who said quoting this is for you Nick quoting from Isaiah 56 7 and 8 then he taught saying to them is it not written my house shall be called what a house of prayer for who for all the nations question mark but you have made it into a den of thieves he he was he was speaking from Mark 11 17 so here's what I want you to do as a final application that is very difficult but very practical and he say it's what the word says here it is most churches do not have an all-out weekly fully devoted corporate prayer meeting as Jesus commands and requires of us to have however this weekly meeting must be a hundred percent devoted to prayer for all nations including the nations of prisons and jail ought to be a most critical most urgent best attended meeting of the week with everyone in the congregation present including the senior pastor elders and deacons if not how in the world are we going to see the great commission fulfilled in all the nations including the nations of prisons and jails as also commanded and required by Jesus remember what he said I was a stranger and you did not take me in I was naked and you did not, did not what clothe me I was sick I was sick next week next week healing meeting here sick and in prison and you did not visit me Matthew 25 43 so I'm asking you tonight to cast this vision for your church to fulfill Jesus mission of the great commission and the father's love for the nations for the greater Halloween of his holy name hallelujah here it is what I want to see on my tomb scribed on my tombstone as my legacy for eternity when God the Father chooses to retire me for good and my body is put to the ground waiting for my new glorified body Jesus also purchased with his blood for me as soon as Jesus comes back on his white horse hallelujah this is what I want on my tomb Manny Mill was a man devoted to what? that's it that's the only thing I want on my tomb I don't want there how many prisons I went to did I travel the world did I did, did I write books did I did, no 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 I just want on my tomb on my tombstone Manny Mill was a man devoted to prayer because that means that I know my father intimately people ask me what do you guys do we pray how in the world can we do any ministry with just activities that count for nothing just to feel good about ourselves if we don't pray prayer is your engine prayer is your life prayer has to be more important than the water that you drink than the food that you eat than the air that you breathe because prayer is a relationship with God my Father and I'm committed to be like Christ and therefore to be like Christ I have to pray like I have to learn to pray like Christ I want to be able to pray like Christ 
That's my objective every day. I want to pray like Christ. I want to see results. So, so this week, I'm anticipating already. I want to see people healed. I want to see people healed from scars and wounds, emotional wounds, physical illness, mental illness. I want Jesus to do miracles next week. This is, this is going to be a biblical prayer meeting. I don't know how am I, how am I going to do it yet, but I'm praying. And my friend Dara actually texted me and said, Manny, you used to call people to the front to pray for them for healing. Will you do it again? I said, okay, Dara, let me, let me think about that. Let me pray about that. And then I was with my friends here yesterday at noontime at the Cononia house. And I consulted with them and they said, yes, go for it. And then I had to convince my wife. So last night, late at night, I said, Barbara, what do you think if next Thursday we have an all-out healing prayer meeting at RTC? Said, yes. I said, okay, I got now my approval. <laughs> Let's go for it. I sent you an email today and to Jim too. And Jim told me I got it. So yeah. Amen. So come ready, and of course my friend Bill and Karen and the and the band from the, they're going to come next week and play for us. We're going to see, huh? And the food too. So we have the senior pastor coming to play the guitar, I think, and we have great food coming. I don't know what they're cooking yet. That's all right. But Bill is a drummer, so we're going to make some noise next week. We're going to make some noise next week. I never seen him play the, the, the drums before. So we're going to have a Psalm 150. Uh, ban here next next week. So, so will you will you consider bringing some people next week that you know are struggling? See, my vision for the church is this: that when you get to a church on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, whatever the time is that you go to your church, even Saturday, that people will be quiet. We talk too much in church. People would be quiet and they would have a hundred people on the front praying for people. Praying for people. And then when the service begins, there will be another hundred people hiding somewhere in the church praying for the message. And then when we they finish the message, they will come out and they will keep praying. My house shall be a house of prayer. Not a house of preaching or music, but a house of prayer. Everything else flows out of prayer. Preaching, music, everything flows out of prayer. Church is not a show. No, 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 no. It's a house of prayer. It's a sacred house. We come in before a holy God, a holy Father. We have to come with reverence. We have to come and say, Father, I'm not here for you to give me anything. I'm here for me to worship you for everything. Amen. I want to see Sherman be healed. Amen. He has cancer in the pancreas. I want to see him healed next week. Amen. I mean, I want to see some miracles next week. I want to see the entire West Cross mission. Let's run a, a bus. How many people are in need of West Cross, uh, Roland? Everybody. Everybody. Okay, I, I want to make sure that you got the right answer. <laughs> Everybody's in need of the West Cross mission. All right, let me pray. So thank you, Father, again for this message tonight on being devoted to prayer. Father, will you give us this conviction tonight? Will you make us radical? Will you make us fervent? Will you make us real? Will you make us lovers of your holiness? And will you, Father, give us the hunger and the thirst to go after you in prayer with tenacity, with intensity, 
with persistency, with your word. Oh, Father, we want to pray to you your own promises. We want to experience, Father, healing. We want to experience power. We want to experience miracles. We want to see people come to Christ. We want to see people resurrected. We want to see people become real. We want people, Father, to experience security in Christ, I pray. So, Father, will you help us? Will you help us now as we take some time to be together, pray together, fellowship together? And to this picture that we're going to take. Thank you again for the gift that you have given to Jim Woodmer. And thank you for the testimony that we're going to give to the people behind bars to this picture. So we have to smile, everybody. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.